Pastor Lukulwai. Yes, sir. My brother once told me that when you're writing a sermon, it's yeah. like you're writing a rap song. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting statement. I think generally, if you do look at, um, for example, rap, they generally follow a poetry style of writing. I get to my teens and, you know, my encounter, I would say, with um, hip hop was accidental because I had a friend of mine who, you know, back in the day we had Walkmans. So he had his Walkman and he's like, man, I got this song, you must listen to it. But um, like, like it's said in the scriptures where it's implied that by beholding me become changed. Uh, very quickly, uh, there were subtle changes that started uh, to take place in my character and personality. So um, um, getting out of that, it, it really took God working a miracle uh, because I was battling this depression. I could feel like there's something missing in my life. I couldn't put a finger on what it was, but I knew that, you know, this, this life that I'm living it is not adding up. Uh, when you come to the point or the stage in your life where you are contemplating the idea of getting into the relationship, getting into a relationship oh you should double your prayers yes so that is to say that if you've been praying once you've been you should double them you should pray twice i think the first thing that i'll mention is that our creativity is evidence that we are created by god who is a creator and he's a creative being so our our our, our the creative aspect of our being is something that we should celebrate and develop more than anything else uh, but ultimately i think one uh, scripture that i love is first corinthians 10 verse 31 that says Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, uh, in anything that you do, do all things to the glory of God. Yeah! Pastor Lukolwai. Yes, sir. My brother once told me that when you're writing a sermon, yeah. it's like you're writing a rap song. <laughs> right? Because you go in there, you have yeah. a hook, you have a verse, you have a chord, whatever. However, yeah. you, you would assemble a, a rap song. And I'm saying this to you because I know that you relate. Yeah. So what do you think about that statement? Um, it's a very interesting statement. I think generally, if you do look at, um, for example, rap uh, music or the lyrics thereof, they generally follow a poetry style of writing. So I think uh, poetry has a certain format or pattern that would be consistent, whether um, it's going to be read or it's going to be stored in a form of literature or music will accompany it. So I think um, a, a piece of literature that is written well, especially one that is poetic in nature, generally has uh, similar attributes. And I think maybe there's an element of truth to it. Of course, uh, inspiration-wise, maybe uh, there would be a variation in terms of source. <laughs> but yeah, I think the general principles of poetry apply on both ends. Yeah. Mm, okay. So earlier I heard you call yourself Le Leko. Yeah, Leko. Yeah, Leko, yeah. Leko, yeah. yes. Yeah. So... I, I don't know if they still call you Leko right now. Yeah. They still call you Leko? Yeah, some people do. Actually, um, because I'm Lekolwane, Lekolwane, so mm. um, growing up, especially in the areas of my life in Zimbabwe, many people could not say Lekolwane. Ah, okay. So I was called Lekolwane. So ah. the, <laughs> the shortcut, obviously, was Leko because okay. uh, the name is a bit long. So that's, I, I think, where Leko comes from. Mm. Uh, but I think it, it just stuck with me and throughout the years that's what people have been referred to. Some people call me Vic, which was my other nickname. So Vic. Yeah, it could be Vic, it could be Leko. Why Vic? Um, okay, this is another funny story because um, when I was young, um, there were teachers who were struggling to say Lekolwane. Mm. So they're like, no, just give yourself a name that I uh, <laughs> think we can work with. You know, it will not be official. Yeah. So I just said, for some reason, I just said Victor. Vic. So uh, Victor stuck with me all my life. And actually some people still think it's like my formal name uh, so they are shocked to learn that i'm not victor so yeah. it was one of those things of uh, people are struggling to pronounce uh, my name yeah that's so cool um yeah. even like when you when you learn the chinese language yeah. they give you names okay so I, I, I used to learn mandarin All when right. i was in high school and my name was tung 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 yeah <laughs> it, 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 mean, it means winter oh wow. i was born in the winter that's nice but yeah, yeah um so take us into your journey how yeah. The reason why I have you here is yeah. because you shared when you were preaching earlier yeah. today that um, you used to be a rapper. Yeah. So uh, please take us through that journey and unpack it for us. Speaking yeah. also your, about your upbringing, yeah. just your general background. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, I would say that um, I was brought up in a Christian home. I think that would be one of the best things that ever happened to me because um, to be exposed to the faith and the knowledge of God um, it is perhaps the greatest gift that a, a human being can ever be rendered. 
um, I could say that uh, there are so many things that I can look back on my life experience and say that uh, I can truly be grateful for the efforts of my parents to try to bring us up uh, in the way of the Lord. So I'm um, brought up in a Christian home. My parents are gospel ministers. My father is a pastor, now retired. Uh, we were brought up in a Christian home lacking nothing in terms of love, in terms of Christian principles, and even the example of the parents. Uh, I don't think there was anything lacking in that regard. But I think, as we know, the way of life goes, children are children. <laughs> and um, uh, one of the things that was characteristic about me was that I, I, I had a love for reading from a tender age. I actually just go through books. Um, I sometimes share to people that um, I, I went through a significant number of books in my father's collection. Uh, before finishing primary school, I'd read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. I was going in, through in like primary school. Yeah, primary school. So <laughs> Wait, just before yeah. you say it, the last guest yeah. we had on our show, yeah. um, Uncle Swan, he was saying yeah. that he his yeah. then girlfriend, whenever it was, yeah. she said that he's so he's such a meticulous guy that yeah. he probably had an organized playtime. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, like like for me, I was I was a complete I'll say I was a bookworm yeah. because um in, in terms of my personality or temperament, I really didn't have uh, any inclination or interest towards the outdoors. Hmm. So books were my play field and I would just spend time diving into books and uh, reading and absorbing as much knowledge as I could. So whenever I'd be um, interacting with my friends, I'd be like quoting all these like, you know, <laughs> Stephen R. Covey in Seven Habits of Highly Effective. And they look at me like, you kid. And uh, I remember one of my friends actually said, no, you're an old man traps, trapped in a little kid's body. Uh, so that's one thing they used to actually refer me as. I didn't take it in any wrong way, yeah. but I used to love reading. So my love for reading, I think, developed in me a love for poetry and poetic literature. And I would always pay close attention to how words and sentences were structured. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something that uh, appealed to me. So um, being brought up in a Christian and Adventist home and environment where everything was done according to the Christian standards, I can't fault my parents for everything. I, I get to my teens and, you know, my encounter, I would say, with um, hip hop was accidental because I had a friend of mine who, you know, back in the day we had Walkmans. So he had his Walkman and he's like, man, I got this song, you must listen to it. Hmm. So you know, I didn't know what to expect, but then I just plugged in my ears and I started uh -huh. listening. And I was listening, I was like, because, because I wasn't listening to, you know, the, 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 what the, you usually the, yeah, the yeah. beats per se, but, you know, the flow and the lyrics and hmm. how words were coming together. So I'm like, this is interesting. You know, mm. I've, I've never, I mean, you are from a Christian home. You don't know anything of this sort. Um, I want to listen to this more, you know. <laughs> uh, and actually, uh, they say that the, the road to hell is uh, paved with good intentions. Yeah, so yeah. my intentions were good from the start to say, you know what, let, let me just give this thing a bit more, you know, uh, attention. Maybe there's, some, there's something more that I can learn about the word, word play here. Of course, obviously noting that, okay, there are some words there that are not appropriate. Uh, but yeah, you know, it can't be that bad after all. Mm. So th that's how really my, my journey with this thing started. And then from there, it really just, you know, was just taking a deep dive into it because now you, you, you just start sourcing this music uh, from friends. Uh, you're listening to it. You're giving yourself time. And I was really applying myself, like the force of my intellect to really grasping yeah, yeah. and seeing what these guys... And I thought, this is very interesting. The, the way these guys are so intricate with their lyrics... Um, they, they, they must be really good with words. And uh, that, that's how the journey really starts, yeah. Fun fact about me, I yeah. also used to rap in high school. Wow, like, yeah. I used to write, yeah. write songs yeah. during break time yeah. and we would try and battle rap, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm interested to know, like, the influence that the yeah. music now brings into your life. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I guess this was in primary school when yeah. you started listening to yeah. your Walkman, yeah, yeah. right? And in your story, yeah. I think that the full-on transition help yeah. happens when you're in high school now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please walk us through that journey. Yeah, so you start listening to the music and, you know, it's just, you know, oh, I'm listening to this music. And by the way, I'm, I'm still a church kid. We're going to church. We're doing the clubs. Everything is relatively mm -hmm. normal. But um, like, like it's said in the scriptures where it's implied that by beholding me become changed, uh, very quickly uh, there were subtle changes that started uh, to take place in my character and personality uh, that were not there before. So um, in my listening to uh, this particular genre of music, for example, one of the things that quickly happens is that 
uh, your work begins to change. Yeah. Uh, you start you, booming and bad. Yeah, your, 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 your attire starts to change. Uh, your, your pants, uh, of course, with caution because you don't want to also shock your parents. <laughs> but when you are free, they hang a bit lower than they normally do. Um, your, your, you know, the, the people you want to associate with changes. Uh, but very quickly, your character starts to be patterned after these particular... And mm. especially listening to these uh, stars, these celebrities, uh, they, they make such an impact on you without realizing that you want to pattern your life uh, after their life. So you want to look like them, you want to sound like them, you want to be like them. And that's basically how things started to, I would say, go downhill. But, but all in all, I'm still a you know, good kid at home listening to my parents going no to church. No alcohol, no drugs. No, no, no. I, actually, one of the things that is actually very fascinating, I, I think this is very important to highlight, is uh, the grace of God. I, I was a very smart kid because um, I actually would often say this to my friends, like, do you guys know the dangers of alcohol? Like, what you're doing to your liver. <laughs> so I, I was, I was, I was oh, yeah, reading Stephen yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I was actually like uh, very conscious of issues of health. Uh, I've never taken drugs, never smoked, never mm. drank alcohol, never tasted it. Uh, I didn't have an inclination to anything. that. And actually one of the things that I did hold supreme in my mind was, you know, um, if I were to take these substances that are damaging to my body, I would uh, risk damaging my mind, which I need to be at its optimum state <laughs> when I'm writing, yeah, to be the best. So why would I then take drugs that would now limit my capacity? So um, also I'll, I'll say that was partly um, uh, attributed to my uh, Christian upbringing because uh, my parents did instill these values from a tender age. Mm. So of course, but I would rationalize these things and say, okay, it doesn't make sense to smoke. Yes, guys are yeah, yeah. smoking and doing what they're doing, but. Uh, I, I, I don't do that and I wouldn't do that. So it's, it's really the grace of God more than anything. But um, the one thing that I did uh, keep and preserve was the music. And whatever it said, whatever it did, uh, whether the lyrics were uh, against my beliefs or uh, vulgar in a sense, uh, at some point, you know, initially you are shocked. Oh, wh why is he using that language? Uh, this is not right. I'll be careful. I'll look for the censored stuff. But um, as you are constantly uh, desensitized, uh, you start to see, you know, this, this is just like any other. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's I mean, not that bad. People are saying this all the time. Yeah. What could be uh, wrong with it? So you are constantly conditioned to uh, conform to this uh, particular standard of living, if I could put it that way. Mm. Yeah. That is so interesting. Yeah. Um, as you were speaking, I think yeah. what was what coming to my mind yeah. um, about like the influence that the music has on you. Yeah. Um, for you, earlier you said it's, you still have the walk, right? <laughs> of course, or not necessarily. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not necessarily that I have the walk. It was just to illustrate that um, uh, music impacts you in the way that it does change the way that you walk. I no longer walk like I used to. I no longer have the lean and the bounce and the step yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that stuff. Uh, it's actually not even healthy for your posture to be, to be uh, leaning to and be, bouncing. Yeah, to be leaning and bouncing all over the place and having your spine off center in terms of gravity. So uh, you, you become actually, as you give your life to God, you become more health conscious to realign your life back to what God intended for you. So, yeah, that, those are things that I'd say I've put away and abandoned. Mm. Uh, and I, I really would say to people, you know, don't do that because it does affect your health. Yeah, I was, I was actually trying yeah. to get the, like, yeah. the extent at which it actually yeah. impacts yeah. you and affects yeah. you. Like, yeah. how long into your life does it affect yeah. you? You still struggle with some of those things right now, temptations? Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. I always say to people that, you know, it's amazing uh, how the grace of God works uh, because I, I pray, I, I'll say currently I do not have any inclination or mm. interest or desire. You know, I don't, I don't even look at that lifestyle as something uh, desirable. Uh, even if I was sitting here and someone was to drive by and music is playing that I used to listen to, uh, my heart would bleed to say, you know, I, I wish I, this person understood what they are doing to themselves mm. because we are created in the image of God. And uh, some of the things that we do and some of the things that we listen to, some of the things that we watch, uh, other things that we read actually degrade us. And I think that's, that, that's the key thing. So um, when you understand uh, the value that you have as a human being and the value that God places on you, you would not desire something that degrades or lowers your value. Because like, for example, um, you know, you listen to this, uh, to this music it transforms you, it changes you, you become something that you are not. You, you actually lose yourself and become someone else. 
and uh, maybe even in terms of character, like one of the things that, uh, that, that happened very quickly, I started to have a temper, which was something very strange. I was just a soft guy, you know, agreeable guy who, who wouldn't get angry. But, you know, you are connecting with these angry people and yeah. their experiences, and they are angry at the They're police, they are ear. angry at this and that. <laughs> and suddenly you also become angry and not knowing why you are angry, and you start developing a certain attitude without realizing it. So this is the thing that I, I say to people about media and music is that um, we, we, we aren't just listening to these things. We are connecting with people's lives. We are connecting uh, with people's experiences. And they are leaving an imprint uh, mm. on our character, mm. which actually was intended by God to have the character of God. Yeah. Mm. So I want you now to tell us, how do you get out of the lifestyle? Yeah. All right. Um, for me, uh, one of the things that I believe was very pivotal, I would say for one, was that my, my parents uh, were praying for me. Um, and this is what I say to parents, because one of the other things that I'll mention is that I'm an introvert, which is uh, very interesting. So um, I, I always say to people that introverts express their rebellion differently uh, because we don't go out there and, you know, do something erratic. Uh, it, it's like the prodigal who was lost at home, uh, who never left home, who was always obedient, compliant. Uh, if you look at my life, generally, you wouldn't see anything that was seemingly wrong, just a regular kid growing up, going through his teens, I was still participating in church activities. Sometimes I would conduct Sabbath school. You know, all those things that I expect of you. But um, one of the things that I always mention is that uh, my heart was not in God. I was not given uh, to God. I was given to uh, the things uh, of the world, if I could say so. So um, one of the highlights I would say, because, you know, you are listening to all this music in your own personal private space that is negative. And that breeds um, depression and uh, depressive thoughts. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, you can't be listening to music about violence, people killing each other, people extorting people and all that, and expect that that will not have an impact on you. So, so it was affecting even your Absolutely, work, your absolutely. Mental, health, uh, mental health. Yeah. By, by the way, but I, I, on, on top of that, what was also surprising, I was still doing very well academically mm. in terms of my academic performance. But I think in, in my personal space, in my uh, personal life, I could feel like, uh, I could actually feel that there's something that is missing in my life. Um, I, you know, by the way, you are doing the whole religious thing. You know, we're going to church every week. We're going to church during the week, uh, midweek prayers, vespers. Uh, you still can't put a finger on the fact that, you know, doing all these things does not translate to having Jesus in your life and having him as Lord. And uh, means that you are also missing out on the peace that comes with knowing him. So um, I, I was struggling with uh, depression in a sense. So wait, and, just, yeah. just to chip in with, yeah. this, with this question, yeah. would you say that um, today, today us as yeah. the youth, yeah. music is, is a huge part of yeah. the huge reasons why we, yeah. we are going through the depressive things that yeah. we're going through. I'm just speaking to your story. Yeah, and, and, and here's the idea. I, I say that, uh, like I said earlier, by beholding, we become changed. Mm. Uh, there's actually, um, if you look at some psychologists who argue this, of course, there are some who disagree, uh, but there, there's, a, there's a school of thought that says uh, entertainment and media, for example, violent video games, uh, is a contributing factor to the problem of gun violence in schools in the West. Um, these kids who are overexposed to this kind of stuff, they are desensitized while they are playing games. And when the thoughts come or the temptation come to, now let me get a gun and go to school and shoot up everyone, uh, the conscience has been uh, killed or silenced uh, completely by overexposure to violence to the point where they are numbed to it. So, so um, this is just, of course, I'm saying like th 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 there's a debate over whether that, that is really true. just, but it's just your my experience, either. my experience actually is that the fact that music could result in a change in how I dress mm -hmm. could change in, uh, have an impact in how I speak and the kind of vocabulary. Imagine starting to use language that I was not brought up uh, speaking in the home, uh, could change how I view life. My outlook on life now becomes negative. Imagine that, um, I live in a country that is relatively peaceful. Mm -hmm. We don't have issues with the police, but you are listening to all these guys who are angry at the police in their countries, and then you see a Botswana police vehicle pass, and you are angry. And the question is like, oh, what, what have the police done to you? But you yeah. know, you're, you're connecting with people's experiences that are completely divorced from your own, but they're having a real life impact on you. So I do say that um, 
uh, garbage in, garbage out. Oh, yeah. if, if you take in a lot of uh, negative and evil, the results are that that negative and that evil is going to impact your mental state, whether you like it or believe it. Um, and I believe that uh, my depression was a result of that. I do believe, in fact, even as, as a pastor now who counsels young people sure. who struggle with such, I often tell them that pay attention to your... Uh, uh, what you feed your mind mm. because that actually turns out to be your character. So if you are, all, your mind constantly ponders on murder, violence, and all these uh, vile things, what kind of thought patterns are going to come out of that? Mm. Depression and all kinds of stuff. So I do believe, th this is my belief without uh, reservation, that uh, part of the challenge that young people are facing and uh, battling and dealing with today has to do with a lot no no it's not just music mm. but it's the movies it's the books it's the literature it's the friends we associate with conversations who, yeah the conversations the environment that we're in that does have an impact and leaves an imprint on us and, and my life is a testimony to that but you know one thing that i'm grateful for is that uh, god was faithful and i i say to people this that um my, my testimony is one of those of how uh, God preserves us in our stupidity. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't smart in any way. The fact that I, I could be around people who had access to uh, drugs and alcohol mm. and all that, and I didn't take any of that. Mm. And I could talk to them like, guys, why are you doing this? Don't mm. do that. Um, simply, so the guys would be like, let's go out. I'm like, no, I'm not going out. I'm going to sleep. Bro. Um, I, I, I never went out once, like mm. to a single party or anything. But in my own personal space, I was a very strong, dedicated hip-hop head who listened to music and um, to a point where one of my friends would remark that, you know, if I had not heard a song, it was probably not good. So mm -hmm. I, I became the standard of good music. So guys like, uh, Leko, do you know the song? I'm like, no, I'm not. They're like, ah, I'm not going to listen to it. It's probably not good. Uh, but I'm a pastor's kid. I'm supposed to be telling people about, about Jesus and his coming. Yeah. So um, um, getting out of that, it, it really took God working a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I was battling this depression. I could feel like there's something missing in my life. I couldn't put a finger on what it was, but I knew that, you know, this, this life that I'm living is not adding up and I need something more. And um, I was even looking at what was becoming of my friends, some of whom were in the church, and you look at their lives because of the choices that they are making, which are partly being influenced by this, because you're listening to these guys who are selling a lifestyle that says, you know, go out and drink and party, and this is life, are you together? And you see your friends making choices and negative outcomes come as and you're like, whoa, um, what are we doing with our lives? You know, and we, we are some people who are people who are supposed to know better and do better. So um, God came through for me miraculously. And, uh, you know, one thing that I always say to people is that um, when God is looking for you, uh, God will come and meet you at your point of need. Um, some of us will need a sign. Some of us will need just a message. Some of us, God will speak to us directly through a dream. Some, some of us will need God showing up miraculously and doing something dra dramatic. Uh, some of us will need God to drag us down uh, the pits like Nebuchadnezzar, send you eating grass for a number of years. But whatever it is that you need to be saved, God will do just that. Mm. Now, for me, my challenge is also being gifted um, academically and intellectually. Um, uh, people could not argue with me. You know, if you wanted to come and have a rational debate about music and stuff you're not going to win because i had very solid arguments <laughs> so arguments were not going to work sermons were not going to work uh people had tried i remember one elder um tried to um speak to us one time about music and afterwards i went to him and crushed that man you know he he, he looks so you know to, when i think about it i feel so bad for him because mm -hmm. he had nothing to say but i'm praying for you you know because you couldn't reason out things with me uh, but one day the Lord worked a miracle. I was actually, uh, it was one Sabbath. I was in, this was in my teens now. I'm at Mount Central Church. And one of the youth, uh, young lady, comes to me. This is a very weird encounter. Mm. And she says to me, um, uh, I want to talk to you because uh, God showed uh, me a dream about you. And if you have a few moments, um, I'd like to speak to you. So... In my heart, I laughed out loud like I've been waiting for one of these uh, dreamers to come and uh, I'm going to crush her like I've been crushing all the other elders and people and friends before me. And I said, yeah, yeah sure, sure. Let's hear what this dreamer is going to say. Uh, but, you know, it was remarkable because from there, I would honestly say she told me the story of my life. 
And um, she actually, like, just to summarize, because it's a long story, but yeah. she was shown in a vision that um, she was on a mountain and I was walking down a, the mountain with someone, someone close to me. Mm. And as we were walking down, there was like a road that was constantly getting darker uh, by the minute, if I could say. So she was standing there trying to scream at us to say, where are we going? What is it that we are doing? And um, we were not responding in any way. So she, was, she also couldn't move from where she was standing. So she's trying to scream. She can't scream anything. So as she turns, she says, in this dream, of course, there's someone standing next to her. And uh, she asks, what is going on? She says, you see that, that young man, speaking of me, going down that hill, um, he has made life choices that are, are leading him down the path of death. And if he does not repent, he's going to die. Mm. So I'm standing there listening to this person. I'm like, okay, she can't be serious. And then she goes on to say, you are depressed right now. You are battling depression. You are going through a lot. There are thoughts that are coming into your mind like this and like this. You know, she started to tell me everything that um, no one knew. Like, uh, yeah. as she's speaking, I'm literally there like, no, no, no one knows that. No one knows that. Wait, no one knows that. How does she know that? Like, no. And I get to a point where I'm like, wait, but God knows. You know, that's like the light bulb moment for me. Ah, like, yeah. there's no way she knows all these things that I'm struggling with that, like, not even my friends know, not even my parents know, not even... Like, like to, to everyone around me, I'm a normal person, but I'm battling these uh, depressive thoughts. Uh, but then she, I'm like, wait, God knows. So, like, that's the moment I'm defeated. I, like, uh, throw my weapons down. I have nothing more to say. I just listen to her finish off her counsel to me. And she said, listen, if you don't repent uh, and give your life to God, you are going to die. Mm. But God wants to use you. God has a purpose for you. So, you know, um, those words really like struck a chord in my heart that uh, they, they never, like people had preached and everything, but these words really struck a chord and struck a nerve. And I had nothing to say, but you know what? Thank you very much. So I went home. Now, um, on this particular, like, if this is Sabbath. The following Sunday, I'm just home. Now, there's something weird that happened that I can't account for. Because there was a point during the day, because I'm still thinking overnight of the words of this, uh, this lady. Um, what they mean, is God really looking for me? Mm. Wait, God is real? Uh, because God has just revealed these personal God, details of my life yeah. to this stranger who I don't know, who's also just coming she to me. She was a stranger, by the way. Like, I, like we, that was the first time we really met and encountered and began, we actually started being friends from that point. Mm. So it was very weird, you know. But I remember being home the following day. Now, for some reason, there was a time where, like, I, I, I was just home and I, I, I started to look for everyone, like my mom, my dad, my siblings. Like, people are gone. I don't know where they are gone to. Like, I'm like, wait, Where's everyone? Okay, I'm just alone. I'm here in the house. Okay, that's fine. That's weird. Okay. So I just go and sit in the dining room. And as I'm sitting there in the dining room, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell people like, uh, there's nothing like a maroon sun, you know, mm. uh, so bright and, you know, and everything. But I was in a room and it was just so dark in the afternoon, broad daylight. And I could just feel this heaviness, this weight on my shoulders. And um, at that time, I, I had tears going down my eyes, you know, and I was reflecting on the words of this, uh, this young lady who had spoken to me. And I remember um, at one point, I just cried and just said, Lord, save me. That's, that's all I said. What was your prayer? That was my prayer. I, I didn't say anything, but I just said, Lord, save me. And uh, what I recall and uh, what happened was that I felt a weight being lifted from my shoulders. Like, like it was literally, like something leaving. Like I suddenly, wait, I'm feeling lighter now. Uh, in addition to that, suddenly the room started to become a bit brighter. Like, I'm like, wait, what's going on? <laughs> and I remember like experiencing a peace in my heart mm. that I'd never felt before. I'm like, wait, has Jesus just come into my heart? <laughs> what's going on? I was crying, I know what to do. It was just weird, I'm like, wait, wait. Wait, have I just experienced Christ coming into my heart? Like, I was at peace. I, I, I felt, you know, th those thoughts going away. And it was just such an amazing experience. And I just, you know, prayed and I just thanked the Lord. And it was just an amazing experience. I know people say that you know, salvation is not an emotional thing. Well, uh, I can't use my experience as an authoritative thing. But I can tell that I, I felt the presence of God that day. And... At that moment, I just vowed to say, you know what? The world behind me, <laughs> the cross before me, no turning back.
Mm. And uh, it was just a remarkable thing, uh, giving my life to God in that manner. Now, what I'll say is, um, from that point on, I went back, because she was a member, that young lady was a friend at uh, the same church. Uh, I went back to her and shared my testimony. She said, you know, Jesus has come into your heart and uh, just start the process of building a relationship with God. Mm. And then she started sharing some resources. Resources I had at home on my parents' shelf, yeah. which I never paid attention. Like, go and read that book. Go and read your Bible. Read messages to young people. Read Steps to Christ. I started now uh, paying close attention to the, the words of these books and what they meant. And uh, I started building my work with God. Now, one of the other things I'll mention, which was very important, was... Going back to the people I used to work with, my friends in the crew, in the clique, and telling them, you know, guys, um, I've been working with you, uh, but I've decided to follow Jesus. And it yeah. means that a lot has changed. Like, it, like you, you uh, got to a point where now yeah. your friends, you're telling them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I owed it to them. I got to go. And this is the thing. Many of us uh, make this mistake of thinking that once we've given our lives to God and we've repented, we don't owe it to the people we have deceived to, to go back to them and write them. and tell oh, them. Okay. Whether they accept or not or repent, that's between them and God. But I don't mind. So I was literally going to some people and being like, listen, you know, you remember I gave you that song? Yeah, yeah. I was not supposed to do that. Yeah. Jesus is coming again. <laughs> And I remember a number of my friends thinking, man, this guy is weird. Now he's <laughs> talking about Jesus. The other thing that was remarkable, and I'm talking about the change that comes in when Jesus comes into the heart. Mm. There's music I used to listen to and didn't have a problem listening to at the time. But I remember um, when I f would then, you know, try to play it. There was something in me that just said, no, 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 no. Yeah, you, you can't be listening to this. It's not hitting the same. Yeah, thing. there's something wrong with this. You yeah. understand? Uh, because a different principle had taken over my life. Sometimes the challenge that we have, especially as youth, is that uh, we are doing things because the pastor said so, because mm. our parents said so. But I always say to people, one of the best things that can happen is to have Jesus come into your heart and you let go of the world simply because Jesus is the one convicting you of that. And this is why I say, when you asked me earlier to say, do I, am I tempted to go back? Do I miss it? No. Because uh, my reason for leaving it was because of a change that I believe came to my heart because of Jesus entering my heart. So I, I think that in a nutshell is how I got out. It, it was yeah. really a miracle of God. Yeah. Um, sermons could not have done it. I know that yeah. some people are going to be saved by sermons, mm. but it just needed God sending someone with a message about a dream and a revelation about my life that shook me. And I'm like, wait, what's going on here? Am I in the presence of God? And I, I, I'll say that is the most miraculous thing that has ever happened in my life. And one of the other things that happened as a result, I, I did mention it, that the music um, produced anger problems in me. Mm -hmm. When Christ came in, my anger problems went away. I remember uh, one of the most remarkable things shortly after I gave my heart to Jesus, I knew, was someone insulting me. And I felt sorry for them. <laughs> you, oh, know, yeah. you, know, you know, I, like, I, 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 I felt sorry for them. And I was shocked at myself. You know when you stop for a moment and step away from someone's insult? Is this me? And you're having a conversation with yourself like, wait, I'm not angry. What's going on? <laughs> what, what is, yeah, I understand you just saw it. Anyway. Just stop. Like, yeah. You're having a conversation with yourself like, wait, I'm not angry. Ah, my blood is not boiling. My heart is not beating. I don't want... I'm actually feeling sorry for this person. Like, you know, Jesus is real. So some of the challenges we have in our personalities and our characters can be done away with and can go away when we open our hearts to Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, that is not a nutshell. That's a handful. <laughs> By the way, yeah. But thank you so much. Yeah. That is a beautiful story. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about something that you love. Yeah, you love talking about your wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I I'm I'm, I'm yeah. bringing this up because I yeah. believe she was influential. Yeah. Um, in your journey to yeah. going on to be a pastor. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Especially, yeah. this is my own. I'm connecting my own thoughts. Yes. Right, especially at the time yeah. you boldly went to her father yeah. Yeah. to tell him that yeah. I would like to yeah. be with this young lady, yeah. Yeah. you know, and then you made a promise to him yeah. that when yeah. I'm hired as a pastor, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Absolutely, just yeah. walk us through that story. Okay, lovely stuff. I would say this, and just to connect the the other story of uh, my past experience and this, um, I would say that um, you know one of the things that I'm grateful to the Lord for was the change that He brought in my life and living. Uh, before I got to the point of uh, encountering my wife, then girlfriend, mm -hmm. I'm very convinced that had I met her at that time yeah. when I didn't know the Lord, she would have been very disgusted 
and repelled by the person that I was and the way that I would speak and the way that I would walk. Uh, but um, the change that Jesus brought, I believe, uh, gave me an advantage mm. uh, in terms of her seeing someone valuable in me. I also say to people that um, I, I don't want to, looking at how, like, the anger problem, I don't want to imagine what kind of a father I would have been mm. uh, who had temper problems because of music. Like, my child does the most basic thing and I'm, you know, flying through the roof because I have a short temper. So uh, there are so many benefits that come with the Lord. But I, I, fast forward, um, I, I've given my heart to Jesus. I'm living for him. I'm involved in mission work. And it gets to a point where God calls me to the ministry. Now, one, one of the interesting things is that I did not want to become a pastor. Mm. <laughs> not because of anything wrong with ministry, but um, uh, I just always believe that you know, I have so much to contribute to the world in terms of I love the sciences, especially the biological sciences. So I wanted to be a scientist, and I said, no, I'm going to change the world through science and all those things. So I was like, and I always say to my younger brother, you know, if I ever try to become a pastor, stop me. <laughs> because, you know, I don't want to become a pastor. So you can imagine, I remember one time having a dream and God told me in this dream, you are going to become a pastor. I woke oh, yo, up yo, and yo, I was yo, so yo, frustrated yo, 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 yo. to say, oh, Lord, why are you calling me? I don't want to become a pastor. So it was a struggle. But long story short, I eventually gave in mm. and accepted that, you know, this is what the Lord wants me to do. And um, uh, I, actually, um, I actually went to the University of Botswana running away uh, from my calling. You no, know, I knew that God wants me right after uh, my secondary education to go. But, you know, I was there, you know, trying to rationalize. No, maybe I'm being emotional, you know. You know, I just left this life and I'm now excited about Jesus. Mm. Maybe this is not a calling. Uh, sometimes I'll be preaching at church and people are like, no, we think you have a gift uh, to be a pastor. And I'll be like, you know, I think maybe I'm a good public speaker. Now I could be a motivational speaker. Maybe this is just, uh, you know, um, uh, people are mistaking my gift of speech for a calling. So mm. I went to the University of Botswana, but experience proved that, you know what, God is calling. So I quit in my second year of varsity to go to Solusi to become a pastor. I meet my wife when I'm now a first year theology, uh, theology student at Solusi. How old are you at this point? Uh, I'm uh, 22 years old. Okay. This is, uh, yeah, 22 years old. And uh, by the way, I've not been in a relationship uh, until this point. Mm. Even while with my friends listening to all this music that I was speaking about oh, girls you, and all you this. Had a, you had yeah. logic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I would reason things out like, <laughs> why should I get into a relationship? What am I going to do? Like, to mess up it, it, it didn't make sense. I want to focus on the art, you know, I want to write, you know, you know I don't want distractions. I want to be distracted by a girl asking me for time. Yeah. So um, I'm 22 years old at this time and I'm convicted, you know, from my spiritual growth. Actually, one of the most important things when you are getting to that point where you are ready to get into a relationship, mm. you need uh, people who are spiritual, who mm. are elderly, who can advise you. So I did engage some people, my mentors, I would say in the faith in the church, elders and friends, and tell them, no, I'm, I'm thinking I'm ready for a relationship. What do you think, like, based on your assessment of my life? Uh, because, and they would ask simple questions like, okay, so what's your plan if you get into a relationship? And the basic principle I've always lived by is, if you are not marrying her, don't get into a relationship with her. Like, mm. we get into relationships to marry. Simple as that. If you look at this person and you are not going to settle with them, you are wasting that person's time. Yeah, you are wasting yeah. God's time. You are wasting emotions. That should be given to Jesus. So that was my philosophy. So that's why I, I really didn't have an inclination to get into unnecessary relationships. Mm. So now I'm 22 years old at this time, and uh, people are praying with me, and I'm also praying to say, no, Lord, guide me to the right person. I do not want to be in a relationship that does not glorify you. So I started praying for Now, the interesting story, um, at this time, uh, my wife is also praying for the Lord to, you know, give her someone who she will settle with for life. Now, what is very interesting, she has a dream, and I wish you, you could interview her sometimes. So very interesting. No, we will have she, her. She's definitely. actually told yeah. in this dream uh, that uh, the person you're going to marry right now is, is actually in Zimbabwe. So I was actually... Uh, uh, in Zimbabwe at school, at Solusi, studying mm. at the same time. So her interpretation is like, oh, so the Lord wants me to marry Zimbabwe someone from Zimbabwe. <laughs> so she's like, uh, psychologically, like getting herself into getting married to a Zimbabwean. And uh, it was a very, it's a very funny story. And actually, what is very interesting is that she had attributes she was looking for in a mm. partner. Yeah. So she was like, describe. And you know, what is interesting is the list that she wrote, when you look at it, it's like a perfect description of me height complexion personality everything 
it was just everything that um, she was looking for. So she was praying at that time. I was also praying at the time. But the Lord allowed us uh, for us to meet at the uh, festival. There was a festival of the lady uh, in Francis Town at the time. Uh, it was uh, an event that came and went. But I'd actually volunteered to serve there. She was actually also volunteering. Mm. So our story is unique because we meet in volunteer service in the Lord's work. But I remember the first time I saw her and I'm like, wow. She's not only beautiful, but she's someone of character. I actually had a chance to engage with her and I realized that this is a woman of character. Intellect. Yeah. A virtuous woman. <laughs> you know, she's the one who, uh, 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 Proverbs, you know, when, when, when uh, Solomon was writing, he was writing about my wife. <laughs> People don't know that, you know. It, it's one of the hidden secrets, but she, <laughs> he was writing about my wife. So, you know, I was like, Lord, um, this is the one. I'm convinced. And I started praying about it. I prayed for some time and then the conviction came, you know, this is the right person. Mm. And then I approached her to, you know, just express what I believed was God's will for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my life and a relationship with her. Um, she's a very principled person. She's a very prayerful person. And she asked for, you know, time to consider and pray. Uh, when she got back to me, uh, she came back with feedback that uh, I, I, I expected it. Uh, but I think it really impressed me because she was very adamant on the fact that if I'm very serious about my intentions, I'm going to speak to her father. Now, um, for me, it was like, you know what? This woman is gold. Uh, I'm <laughs> definitely going to speak to her father. Well, of course, I did say to her that, you know, I am going to speak to him. Please appoint. I'm going to do that. Afterwards, I was really scared. Like, yeah, wait, I, you, buddy, I, hey. I, don't, I don't know who her dad is. Hey. I don't know what he's like. I don't know how he's going to, especially like in our culture, mm. where our parents are very sensitive and to things like this. Yeah they, things, yeah, they could take offense and take mm. it the wrong way. But I'm like, you know, she's worth it. And she's the one whom the Lord has shown that I should get into a relationship with her. So um, I, I'll never forget the day that uh, the appointment was set. I visited them at their uh, church where the family was worshiping. And then someone said, yeah, that's her father. I'm like, okay, that's her father. Uh, and I, I'll never forget the meeting. That was actually my first time meeting my father-in-law. Met with him, long story short, I expressed my intentions. Mm -hmm. I told him that, you know what, I'm a student pastor right now in my first year, and I have intentions to, you know, I'm very serious, my intentions with your daughter. I want to marry her one day. And I actually committed a time frame to say, you know what, I'll be done with school. By 2016, I start working. 2016, when I start working, I'm going to marry your daughter that year. And uh, his remarks to me was that, young man, you are very brave. <laughs> I respect you for what you've done. And, you know, you have my consent to get into a relationship uh, with my daughter. And so started uh, the most happiest uh, relationship. Of course, it's the only relationship I <laughs> ever had. So <laughs> it, 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 was, it was the most precious thing ever. Yeah. But we we're, were together. She encouraged me in the ministry. You know, one of the things that is remarkable is we share same views mm. in terms of God, in terms of church, in terms of spirituality. One time I was actually assigned and attached as a student as a global mission pioneer. I faced some of the greatest obstacles in my ministry as a pioneer and a missionary. But I'll tell you that uh, God used my girlfriend to get me through some of the most... You know, we'll talk over the phone and sometimes I'll be so discouraged... Yes. And she would just say a word, and I'm like, yeah, you know what, I'm going to do this. Fully uh, and up. <laughs> fully charged up, and she was praying for me more than anything. And I believe her prayers were influential in getting me to where I am. Uh, one of the actually uh, last things I'll say on this one, because I've, I've been speaking for some time. Yeah. Um, my wife has really been a great influence on my preaching style. Mm. Um, it'll, be difficult, it'll be difficult to explain how my preaching was <laughs> before I got married. Uh, but um, uh, her, her insights, because one of the things that we do whenever I preach, I'm very open. She shares her thoughts and her reflections on my messages. And I'm always getting feedback from her on what I can, you know, how I can improve, what I, what I could do better. Mm. If the sermon was too short, if it was too long, where I could have put emphasis, we always share notes and exchange notes. So she's been a big influence on my life and my ministry as a whole. And I would not be where I am um, if it wasn't for I believe... After Christ, uh, she's God's greatest blessing to me. Mm. Yeah. That is so beautiful. Yeah. That is beautiful. Um, yeah. I just want to ask uh, a question. Yeah. Like leading up to 2016. Yeah. What, 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 I'm, a, I'm 22 years old. Yeah. What would you tell a young man like me who's yeah. also in that, I also want to get married. Yeah. Uh, when I yeah. finish yeah. school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm asking this question yeah. just so you tell me yeah. preparation yeah. for that time. Yeah. 
Absolutely. There, there's one author that I love. By the way, this is Ellen White. Mm. And um, she shares something very profound and says that uh, when you come to the point or the stage in your life where you are contemplating the idea of getting into the relationship, getting into a relationship, oh. you should double your prayers. Yes. So that is to say that if you've been praying once, you've been, you should double them. You should pray twice. Because you remember that uh, one thing that I always tell people is this, that Satan is very interested as well in who you get into a relationship with. Because uh, our relationships are a matter of eternity. Mm. Some people have become spiritual shipwrecks simply because of who they chose as a boyfriend or as a girlfriend. Uh, for some people, that was the end of their walk with God. Mm. So the choice, what I'll say to you is that the choice uh, in a life partner or in a relationship partner if we could, or a courtship partner or a courtship mate is a spiritual decision. And therefore, it's vital for you to seek God more than anything. Before you even see someone or think, oh, she might be a prospect or something. Like before anyone comes up, sit down and talk to God and ask God to say, God, am I ready? Because the best time to get into a relationship is when God thinks you are ready. ready. Yeah, not, not when you feel you are ready. Mm. Not when all your friends are in a relationship. Not when your parents say, hey, you are too old now. We've not mm. seen anyone. But it's when God thinks. So prayer is, I'll say, is, is like key when it comes to such thing. Then the other thing that I mentioned was um, the counsel of people who are more experienced, yeah. people who are more spiritual than you. I know that um, you'd have a pastor in your life, your church pastor, or a pastor that you look up to. Um, get in touch with such a person, talk to them, get advice for them before you even get started so that they can give practical wisdom and spiritual insights that can help you. Uh, sometimes also guidance on what to look for. Uh, in a woman or in a Christian young lady to, uh, that you'd want to get into a relationship with. That's something that's very important. And then also um, knowing or having a plan for your life. Like, for example, I could tell you that I'm a student in my first year, 2012. I anticipate that I'll start working in 2016. If I'm getting into a relationship, I don't want it to drag for too long. Therefore, mm. 2016, I have a deadline. So uh, one of the things that actually, this one is a funny story. I, we always lament about this with my wife that, mm. you know, I, I didn't get to propose to my wife before <laughs> marriage because like from day one, she knew like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this guy uh, says 2016, he's marrying. Like, so what was the point of one day? Surprise, <laughs> kneeling down. Like, <laughs> it's rather redundant. Like, even yeah. the parents knew. Like, mm. when I started like uh, initiating the process of the wedding, they were not shocked. Like, oh yeah, he did say 2016 after all. So I say that, that that is the difference with how um, Christians do things and how the world does things. Mm. Um, people who are worldly get into a relationship without um, any clear direction, without any spiritual insights or counsel, without considering God and hope it works out if it works out. And if it doesn't, well, it's life on to the next one. But I think the key thing is to be intentional and knowing what you want out of life and what God wants for you more than anything. So I think those are the key things. And then the last one I'll say, which is key, is invest time in studying um, books or resources that will help to shape your view on life. Because, by the way, once you get into a relationship, you are somewhat preparing for marriage. So you, are, you study about courtship, you study about marriage. There, there are a few resources that I like to recommend. Uh, one brilliant book is Adventist Home. Mm. In fact, in Adventist Home, there's a chapter that speaks about qualities that a young lady should look in a young man. And then there's a part that speaks about the qualities that a young man should look in a young lady. And things to pay close attention to so that you don't make uh, mistakes that will cost you your salvation. Messages to young... Uh, messages. Sorry, Adventist Home is one exceptional book. Messages to Young People, of course, it's not a relationship book, uh, but it speaks on the general spiritual life uh, Christian life of a young person. Mm. Messages to Young People by Ellen White is one exceptional book I recommend. The last one is Letters to Young Lovers. Mm. So these are letters that Ellen White wrote to young people in her day, giving them practical insights or counsel on relation. So studying all these resources will better position you so that when you're looking for someone, you can filter uh, the wheat <laughs> from the chaff and make a more informed choice so that tomorrow you are not regretting a decision yeah. that you made or you find yourself stuck because you committed yourself to someone. Mm. So that's uh, the advice I would give to Simon. Yeah, it's practical yeah. advice for all the young men who are looking to get married. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. And marriage is a beautiful thing, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I talk about my wife so much because, you know, uh, I'll say, like, she, she's the best uh, thing that happened in my life and my ministry. And we are now, we've been happily married 
uh, seven years. Mm. And God has been faithful and yeah. God has blessed us with two beautiful kids. We are still young and growing. Our intention is to be together until Jesus comes mm. or until we die. We, we have no plan B, my friend. Mm. So I always t- tell people that there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, th- there's a lot of bad press that uh, uh, marriage is getting nowadays. And people to- look at marriage, especially because of things that happen sometimes out there and we see in the newspapers. But I always say to people that um, marriage was designed by God, and if it's done God's way, it can be a great blessing to your life. So mm. um, I, I'm so happy that you are intending to marry, and I'll be praying for you. Thank you. So that God will guide you. you in that yes. regard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I just, this is now the last segment yeah. of our conversation. Yeah. I just want to speak to the creative in yeah. you, right? Yeah. The one who gets excited yeah. when you read books, when yeah. you think about science, yeah. you yeah. know. So um, generally, our creative space yeah. here is so toxic. Yeah. I'm speaking about the, yeah. the lifestyle, yeah. you know, I think gen- not even just here Absolutely. in Botswana, yeah. like yeah. across the globe, you know, yeah. creatives suffer financially, yeah. all the things you can think about. You exactly. can list yeah. a number of things, you yeah. know. So I just want you to, to ponder on this thought with me. How can we as creative Christians yeah. Yeah. lead that life? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. I think the first thing that I'll mention is that our creativity is evidence that we are created by God, who is a creator and is a creative being. So our, 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 the creative aspect of our being is something that we should celebrate mm. and develop more than anything else. Uh, but ultimately, I think one uh, scripture that I love is 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 that says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink uh, in anything that you do, do all things to the glory of God. So my message of encouragement to creatives out there, especially the Christian creatives, even those who may not be Christians or subscribe, is that let us uh, strive for uh, uh, a ministry. Because I believe uh, once you're in the creative space, you are providing ministry in a sense. Uh, Let us strive for one that seeks the glory of God. And let us uh, never compromise our principles to gain uh, likes, to gain following, to build traction in terms of our platforms, but put God before everything else. And when we seek God's glory, God will elevate us. Uh, The other thing that I also say to um, a a, a a person in the creative space out there is um, uh, know what God has called you to do. Because, Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that I always say to people is that our calling uh, may not always be accompanied by financial success. Um, I always say that the one thing that should drive us more than anything is a desire to impact other people's lives positively and change them for the better. Mm. If financial benefit comes with it, God be praised. Mm. If you're a musician and God has given you uh, the gift of being a psalmist, uh, a songwriter, um, a, a musician, an instrumentalist, God has given you that to be a blessing to someone else. If financial benefit comes with it, God be praised. If it doesn't, God be praised. But use your gift to the glory of God. So I think that can only happen as our focus is on Christ Mm. and Christ is the one who directs everything that we do. And if that is done, I think the world will see uh, God glorified in our content and will strive to do better because unfortunately, people are simply imitating what the majority um, do out there. And you know, oh, this is trending, so I'm also going to do that. But I think we need more Christians who can... Um, uh, shine the light of the gospel and show people that, you know what, um, you can be a content creator uh, who is an influencer, uh, who has a following, but does not compromise on God's principles, but is still able to get the message out there uh, and is also able to um, glorify God and actually win people to the kingdom of God. Mm. I think that's the most important thing that I'll say. I'm, I'm one person, like I was saying, I love reading. I also love writing more than anything else. Uh, but you don't write your sermons. <laughs> I don't write my sermons, though. Unfortunately, I, I have a crisis in my life because I, I, I am a freestyle preacher. Yeah. I think I was mentioning this earlier. Um, I, 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 I get onto a pulpit and ask God for the message of the moment mm. uh, because I don't believe that uh, sermons should be rehearsed mm. and scripted. Uh, of course, there are people who do that, and that's what God wants them to do. I'm not mm. um, uh, casting doubt or negativity on that. You believe God but yeah, this, this, you, is, yeah. this is the gift that God has given me, to stand on a pulpit without a plan, without a script, uh, sometimes not having an idea of which verse I'm going to read. Mm. And then in a moment, God says, go to this book, go to this passage. This is where you will be. And sometimes you don't even know where the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the message is going, but it always arrives where God wants it to go. 
I also love writing. So um, I aspire to publish some books one day. Uh, so by God's grace, please be praying for that. Yes. So, yes, but um, yes. even as um, an aspiring writer, the, the, the desire is to glorify God in that which I write, mm. to glorify God as a person who is a public speaker in everything that I say, uh, to seek God's glory more than anything. And not to glorify myself, because even as I do this, I'm not seeking to build a name for myself. The intention and desire is to hide behind Christ so that at the end of the day, when my life's chapter comes to an end, I have glorified Christ and Christ is seen in me. Mm. What a way to beautifully end it. I would end yeah. there, but I just want to say, ask one more thing. Yeah. So, if you had not been a pastor and yeah. you were in the creative space, yeah. where do you think you would be? Um, if, I, if I was not a pastor and I was still in the creative space, I, I'd, I'd most likely be uh, pursuing the arts Mm. like fine arts um, and animation. Oh, here's a very interesting story, <laughs> especially after becoming a parent. Uh, one of the things that uh, became a grim reality, I used to hear people speak of this in passing, mm. but I think the reality hits once you are a parent is the lack of Christian content cartoons. out there for kids, whether yeah. it's cartoons, whether it's 3D animation, whether it's actual people like using uh, kids to produce content that's relevant, that contextual. Sometimes the only content we have is from the 90s. Mm. I mean, we're, we're living in a different era now. So you'll struggle as a parent to have content uh, that will help your kids to develop the character that you want. So uh, this inspired a desire in me to say, you know what, I wish and desire that one day I could actually do something in this space to produce content for kids that I would have want uh, or that I would desire my kids to experience so they uh, have the values that I hold. Sometimes, for example, I'll just throw one on the, on the side of animation. You'll watch a cartoon of a biblical story or maybe an apparently uh, biblical story. And then there are elements uh, of the story in the animation that are added that are not biblical, mm -hmm. you know, so that uh, the, the, the script writer is trying to fill gaps mm -hmm. uh, that are not maybe mentioned in the Bible. But in the process, accidentally is introducing error mm. into that. And this sticks in the child's mind. So next time you ask your kid, can you narrate the story? The child is narrating what they, exactly what they, what they saw. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 no. He wasn't baptized like that. What actually happened was one, two, three. So I, I think uh, most likely if I was in the creative space or if I actually uh, eventually uh, in my part-time uh, activities do something maybe I like to pursue animation because at, some, at one point in my childhood I, I was very good at art unfortunately and this is bad stewardship I abandoned it mm. I don't realize that I could use this uh, for God's glory but I think it's something that I, I would love to pursue and do so that I, um, I would like to encourage you to yeah. actually do it because yeah, you, I, I feel you can make the time Yeah, and also equally so being a theologian mm. uh, because you'd find that sometimes Theologians come up with ideas and they outsource um, uh, artists to, to illustrate what is in the mind of the theologian. And sometimes what comes out is not exactly what you would have wanted to communicate. So if you are the theologian and the animator and the one controlling the script, ultimately what goes out to the masses is what you are sure is consistent with what the Bible says. So I'll take it as a challenge to say, let me pursue yeah. animation on the side and maybe one day we'll meet and talk about yes. uh, a, a little cartoon about <laughs> Jesus or Peter or the mm. Apostle Paul that is out. But I think th this is for the kids yeah. so that kids can have content that um, is consistent whether the Bible says it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, so I, I host the podcast with a friend of mine. He's a co-host. And yeah. the last question he likes to ask is, yeah. What is a question that you would have wanted me to ask you? Okay. Um, what is a question that I've wanted you to ask? Yeah, that I did not ask. Yeah. How, how does a young person let go of worldliness? Yes. <laughs> how does he? Yeah. How does a young person let go of worldliness? The only way we can let go of the world is by surrendering our hearts to Christ. Um, we cannot abandon the world and its things by having people dictate terms to us of how we should live and what we should do. Um, I love um, uh, James chapter 4 verse 4 that says, um, 
uh, friendship with the world is actually enmity with God. Mm. Uh, when we choose to side with the world and its principles and uh, to side with our principles that go against God, we're actually drawing the lines in the sand and declaring God as our enemy. So we need to surrender our hearts to Jesus and let his word be the one that guides everything that we do. So even as a content producer, I would say, you know, sit down with the word of God and always check what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, is this something that God would approve of? Mm. And it is possible. Like I was saying, I struggled with anger. I struggled with depression. I was feeding my mind with negative and evil things. But by the grace of God, I was only able to get out because Jesus came into my heart. So the key thing is, let us give our hearts and not take them back. Because sometimes we're very good at giving our hearts. And uh, five minutes later, we take our hearts back and run to the make world. But way, yeah. make sure when you give your heart to Jesus, you leave it there and leave it for life. Yeah. Yeah. Sobering thought to leave us with. Um, Pastor Lekolwa Lekolwa. Yes, sir. Yes. I just <laughs> want to say thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so um, much for having me. I don't know the direction that the conversation went because yeah. I, was the, I was the one who was asking <laughs> yeah, the questions. Yeah. And yeah. I had to think quickly. But yeah. I genuinely enjoyed the conversation. I enjoyed so sitting did I, yeah. and listening to you express yourself the way yeah. you did. Thank you. Seeing you speaking happy. You know, yeah. yeah. I just want to also say thank you to God for allowing this Amen. to happen. Amen. Know. Amen. So yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, man. God yes, bless sir. you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you too. Oh, my name is Tobolo Nesiti. For those who may not know, um, I've been doing this ministry for a few months now. And I'm loving it now. Yeah. To be honest, I'm loving it's it. Amazing, and yeah. I hope that we continue to grow together. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Don't forget to invite my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I only have her on. Great stuff. <laughs>